Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm Susan Collins, the Edward M. Gramlich Collegiate Professor of Public Policy and the former Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. And I am just absolutely delighted to welcome all of you to our very special event this evening. Um, it really is a great pleasure for us to be hosting the inaugural James B. Hudak Professor of Health Policy Lecture, which is soon to be delivered by Paula Lance, who is our very first Hudak Professor of Health Policy. But before we get started, I do want to mention that Michael Barr, Dean of the Ford School, very much wishes he could have been here with us this evening to lead this wonderful celebration and offer both his gratitude and his congratulations. The Hudak Professorship was established in March with a, an endowed gift from James B. Hudak, who I will say a bit more about in a moment, but I have to say up front is an MPP alum of the Ford School, a really important claim to fame. <laughs> Um, and his very generous gift supports a faculty member whose research explores health policy issues and aims to address problems in the U.S. healthcare system. Jim recently retired from a highly successful career in healthcare, where he saw firsthand the need for rigorous research-driven evidence um, in health policy. Most recently, he served as CEO and chairman of Paradigm, a market leader in managing catastrophic and complex cases for workers' compensation. Using data and evidence-based approaches, Paradigm achieved vastly superior outcomes and also was able to accomplish over 40% cost reductions, which is really very impressive and the, um, the kind of combined work and the implications of um, that legacy are something that are, are really something to be very proud of. Jim has also been a very generous and long-term supporter and, I must say, a tireless advocate for the Ford School, giving to faculty research as well as student support, including We Listen, which uh, as some of you may know about. It's a student group that facilitates dialogue again, uh, across the political spectrum. And he served as the chair of our Ford School Committee for over 20 years. And I can say um, firsthand how wonderful it was to work with him in furthering the school's mission. Um, his insights, his dedication uh, were really just both a pleasure and made such an impact in a variety of different ways. Um, so we thank you, Jim for your continued generosity, for your vision, uh, for supporting health policy research, and for ensuring that we are able to continue educating future generations of leaders in health policy. Please join me in thanking Jim B. Hudak. <laughs> well, tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Professor Paula Lance. In addition to serving as the Ford School's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, she holds a joint appointment as Professor of Health Management uh, and Policy in the School of Public Health. And now, of course, she is the James B. Hudak Professor of Health Policy. In recognition of her extremely influential scholarship and policy engagement, Paula is an elected member of both the National Academy of Social Insurance and the National Academy of Medicine. She's also an esteemed colleague, a fabulous teacher, and a great friend. There isn't much happening at the Ford School that Paula hasn't had a positive influence on in a variety of different ways. And so it really is an honor for me personally to be uh, introducing her to you here today. Paula's lecture this evening will explore tensions between social policy and healthcare approaches to reducing inequities in health in the United States population. It's a very important topic, and I know that we are in for a real treat. So please join me in welcoming Paula Lance to the podium. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hello. Thank you all for coming today. Those of you in the room, those of you online, streaming in with us. Um, I want to start first by also expressing my incredible gratitude to Mr. Hudak for his very generous gift to the Ford School. And I feel so privileged and honored to be the first recipient 
of it. Um, Jim's vision for this gift was to help the Ford School um, create leaders um, who will use evidence to uh, bring to uh, some of the issues we have in our healthcare system and health policy. Are any of you aware that we have some issues with healthcare <laughs> in the United States? Um, so Jim's vision is that by bringing this gift to the Ford School, it'll help improve the impact that the Ford School might have bringing evidence to health policy and improve health and healthcare in the United States. And again, I'm just really honored to uh, be the first recipient of, of this gift, and I, I don't want to let you down. I appreciate your, your, your trust in me. Um, uh, and it, it's not only in me, I mean, the, some of the, the gift that Jim has given the school goes to some student uh, support, and so I've been able to hire some fabulous students. Wendy Hawkins is in the room, and she helped uh, do some research to prepare for this, this talk. And is Tori here? And another student working with me on a whole, a whole other project, so th thanks for that. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to stand in front of a group like this that, and, and I lecture all the time to big groups of people, but this is really different. I have family here. Uh, uh, thank you for all your support and patience. Um, and I have some dear, dear friends in the room, people who have been friends of mine for well over two decades. You know who you are. Um, and. Um, colleagues, mentors, um, collaborators, uh, Ford School alumni, members of the Ford School Committee. There are so many people in here in the room who I really owe a debt of gratitude to, and I'm, I'm pleased to work with all the time. Special shout outs uh, to a couple of groups. First of all, the Ford School staff who work very hard just to put on an event like this, but also it's a privilege to work with them day in and day out on everything we do at the Ford School. I don't think you'll find a better group of staff anywhere. Um, and then also the students. My God, it's the privilege of my life to be um, hanging around with you and maybe teaching you once in a while, but learning from you day in and day out. It's just really um, a pleasure and an honor to be, to have the job. I, I have a really good job. I'm really happy about it. So, um, oh, I've already lost my clicker. I didn't. It's right here. I'm not that nervous, really, but okay. <laughs> have my clicker. All right. So, shall we begin? I do have a lot of slides to get to get through. All right. So, I'm going to be talking about population health, and first, I just want to define what that is. What do what do people like me mean when we talk about population health? And as we move through the talk, I'll explain to you that there's kind of a new a new version. Um, a new definition for population health, and it, it'll become clear to you very soon that it's irritating to me. But anyway, um, <laughs> population health is decades-long um, uh, field of both scientific inquiry and both public health practice. And when we talk about population health, what we're really thinking about is um, within populations, uh, there are health outcomes and distributions of those health outcomes. And those distributions are according to things like gender and race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and where people live. We know that health varies and is distributed unevenly within populations by those things. And so how do we get there? How do we have these distributions within populations? Well, the things that determine health are also patterned by all these things. They have their own sets of distributions. So determinants of health are, are patterned. That leads to uh, distributions and disparities and inequities over here. And the reason I've been very drawn to public policy through my whole career is because it's policies and interventions at the individual, community, and societal levels that, first of all, have these things be patterned in the first place, but also that's a way to intervene and maybe try to change those pattern, those determinants, and how they're, they're patterned so we can change the distributions within populations. And just, again, a little orientation here at the beginning. Health, what do I mean by health? I really... Um, subscribe to the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And the World Health Organization um, 
states, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, that um, attaining a high standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. And again, that's why I'm, I do the work I do and I'm drawn to public policy. Um, we could, I could give a whole talk just talking about differences. There's differences in health in different groups and different populations and just sort of describe them and try to understand them. But I fundamentally think that they're unjust. <laughs> I fundamentally think that um, disparities and inequalities in health are differences that are avoidable, unjust, and against shared social values. And so all the work that I do is really motivated by uh, this ideal, and no society has ever achieved it, but the ideal of, of health equity, that we shouldn't have differences inequities, disparities in health due to factors that are, unavo that are avoidable, unjust, or contrary to shared social values. All right, so we'll do a little history now to, to get started. So um, uh, here's a nice chart with uh, going back to the 1500s uh, in terms of life expectancy. Uh, and you, know, you can see that life expectancy as best as can be um, uh, measured back many, many centuries ago, sort of bounced around, but really starting in the 1800s, late 1800s, and into the, the 20th century, really populations on the planet started enjoying longer lifespans. You know, and sort of what's happening here? Um, famine and pestilence. As social epidemiologists and demographers like, like me study. Um, so this, uh, there's a lot of, so population health science, again, it's been around a long time, uh, engages in activities like trying to understand what caused this increase in life expectancy that was observed at different points in time for sure and with different patterns in different populations. And uh, the model that's used to sort of understand and explain this is called the epidemiologic transition where you have in a, a population really a period of time with very high mortality and also very high fertility. Uh, but things are kind of bouncing up and down in terms of both of those rates. And again, pestilence and famine are really having a, an effect. But then what usually happens first is the death rate goes down in populations. The birth rate typically going down follows a little bit later. And here, it, most of the reasons that people die are from infectious disease or starvation. And the epidemiologic transition, so again, first the death rate goes down, then the birth rate goes down, and then what becomes the more leading causes of death are things like chronic disease, injury, other, other sorts of things. We would now say human-made diseases. Um, and then, but both the birth rate and the death rate go down, and in the post-transition period, you have um, low mortality, typically low, low fertility rates, um, and then um, very little, but it, infection can, um, can occur, infectious disease deaths can occur, but there, it's, it's sort of bumpy. I'm not gonna explain all these graphs. The point here is that the epidemiologic transition has happened in different, at different points in time, uh, with different patterns, um, in many different countries. Why is that? Um, so people have studied that. And one thing that has been long recognized in the epidemiologic transition, and really looking at any kind of distribution of health in populations, is that it's social factors that are really the driving cause of um, any sort of distribution you're seeing. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, we can go back all the way to 1790, and even before that, um, a famous physician in Germany was writing about the people's misery, the mother of diseases. So understanding that diseases caused by poverty of the people and by the lack of all goods of life are exceedingly numerous. Um, there's actually been um, some studies that were done. Um, Lots of, lots of graduate students were set out to um, measure the height of gravestones all over the UK. Uh, and what else is on gravestones besides their height? Name and length of life, so birth and death. 
There's an extremely high correlation in these older graveyards in the height of the gravestones and the length of someone's life because the height of the gravestone um, really represented that person's social status. So a bigger gravestone, more real estate on the gravestone was more of an indicator of social status. So people, I mean, they had this visual uh, within graveyards representation of that more wealth means a longer life, but also could see this in every, everywhere in society. Um, it's really with the Industrial Revolu uh, Revolution uh, and in France and England where really population health science really kind of got a foothold and as a science. And it was really through observations of what was happening with the Industrial Revolution, you know, about 1760, and everyone understands what, what happened with that. Lots of people moved from the countryside into cities. Um, there were more jobs for people, but the conditions in which people were living were incredible, right? The, the polluted water and air and squalid and crowded housing conditions and work conditions themselves were very unsafe for most, most people. So there's um, what we know from um, studies of health through the Industrial Revolution is that it disrupted notions of health in lots of different ways. First of all, it was sort of where the, the, the birth of the science of population health came. Um, and then realizations that you know, economic development and industrialization were associated with the epidemiologic transition in England and France. It really did fuel decreasing mortality for some people and de decreasing fertility, but it also created even larger disparities in health and welfare. There was all kinds of new suffering <laughs> among the, the lower class, again, moving into the cities and living in these, in these conditions. And also it was the time, um, really kind of the, the first time in writing where there was this normative realization that if, if better health, so the health of the upper class got better with the Industrial Revolution and in some ways got worse or just differently worse for, for lower classes, but there was this realization that if better health is actually even more achievable for the upper class, then it is and it should be achievable for everyone. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, that also gave rise over the next several decades through the industrial, this did not happen overnight. <laughs> um, through the, the 1700s into the 1800s, there was a lot of mobilization, a lot of advocacy, a lot of outcry from people about we, you, somebody has to make our conditions better. And there were appeals to capitalists to do that, but also more appeals to government to um, do something uh, in terms of water, sewer, air, food, sanitation. So here's where we really see the beginning of public investments in public health infrastructure. And these are the things that really drove then the full epidemiologic transition. Um, and we know that from looking at many, many other countries, the, the investments in public health infrastructure and also housing quality and safety, work quality and safety, environment, transportation, all these things matter greatly for health, and countries are not gonna go through this uh, population health transition unless these investments are made. We also know education is very important for population health, especially the education of women. And last point on this very busy slide is that social factors were clearly important to everyone, and this precedes any understanding other than a very rudimentary understanding of germ theory pathophysiology before antibiotics, right? So back, back in the day, I mean, people understood that water in the river in London is pretty nasty. People get sick after they drink it. Maybe, we should, maybe there's something in it, we shouldn't drink it, but people didn't really understand what cholera was for a while later, but they understood that there was something, something wrong there. All right, so where, how are we doing now in the US? Um, this is a, very busy chart, it may be hard to see, of life expectancy um, in a number of countries. And here's the US, and here's many, many other countries who have longer life expectancy than we do. I didn't get the numbers right. So in the US right now, the overall life expectancy is 78.6 years. Average life expectancy, it's 81.1 for women. And sorry guys, it's 76.5 for men. Um, <laughs> That gender difference is observed in every country. It's smaller when in, in countries where there's very high rates of maternal mortality. 
associated with childbirth and pregnancy and other reproductive issues. But um, we do not look so great compared to, to other countries. All right, so also we know, life, but life expectancy, again, here's these patterns within the population, varies greatly by racial status in the United States. I mean, look at that difference. 87.1 years for Asian Americans, um, 75.4 for African Americans. Uh, that must, was that for men and women together? I guess, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a huge difference. Actually, if all of cancer and heart disease were wiped out, that would increase life expectancy in the US by less than five years. So that difference is, it's just tremendous. This figure is of um, infant mortality rates, trends, we could go back many, many more um, decades on that, but the, the trend over 100 years in the United States is that the African-American infant mortality rate has been at least twice that of the white rate. Even if infant mortality rates go down, that disparity has stayed the same. Again, back to life expectancy, it varies within place. Darker colors here represent longer life expectancy, so it varies all over the United States. Even in smaller geographic areas, um, uh, we see huge differences, but here you see the, the, um, the place in Michigan that has the longest life expectancy is where we are right now, Ann Arbor. Um, the place with the lowest life expectancy is Battle Creek. Um, but one thing I wanna point out, so here, here's the highest and lowest in the state of Louisiana, but here you see the, the place that has the highest life expectancy in Louisiana, the New Orleans metro area, is pretty close to the lowest uh, in Michigan. And again, here, that's a map of New York, you can see the same thing. Importantly, I'm sure many of you know this, life expectancy in the United States has actually gone down in the last two years. That's almost unheard of in a developed Western country. Uh, and just to make sure everyone understands what life, do y'all know what life expectancy is? <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's an artificial uh, sort of simulated statistic. Life expectancy is what you would expect if a baby was born today and went through its life experiencing the age-specific death rates that we have right now, that's how long that baby would live. All right, so if a baby born today experienced the rate of death we have in every group, that would be the life expectancy. So in the United States, life expectancy has gone down for the past two years. There are three causes of death that have been rising and that are contributing to this. One is Alzheimer's. Um, uh, but that's a small part of it. The biggest part of it is the increasing mortality rate from drug overdose in the United States. I'm sure you're all aware of what's been going on with that. And also suicide has been going up as well. And in both of these cases, it's gone up for men more than women. And so the decline in life expectancy in the U.S. is really being driven by a decline uh, in life expectancy among men, not really for women. Could tell a story about breast cancer. I've done um, a lot of work on racial disparities in breast cancer, so we have interesting, interesting trends going on there. Um, here's a graph with homicide. We, everybody knows homicide rates vary by age and also by race and ethnicity in the United States. Um, smoking prevalence, it's going down in every, every group but it's really patterned by education. So the group with less than a high school, so again, rates have been going down over the past few years, but this rate is much higher than college grads. So again, patterned by, um, in this case, education, but this is also then within it patterned by gender and race and, and ethnicity. Uh, I could show you many more slides. Uh, I could just, you know, be dogged with my point that um, <laughs> sort of any, any health topic we wanna talk about, any health disease, any disease, any health issue is going to be patterned by social class and by race, ethnicity, gender, place. It goes on and on. Um, I have been so fortunate in my career, I've done a lot, a lot of research in this space and Earlier in my career, I was really fortunate to be able to work with Jim House, who's in the back 
there who took me on uh, as a postdoc when I came to the University of Michigan and um, uh, let me hang around with him and analyze data from uh, a longitudinal study uh, that he started called the Americans Changing Lives Study. So we've done a lot of research looking at this national population-based sample of people followed over time um, to learn about trajectories in health and also to really better understand how is people's income level and their education level and where they live, how does that influence their health over their life course? Um, so we did a lot of work related to that. One of the things that we did that I, that I want to point out here quickly is that, so in population health, there's this concept called compression of morbidity. Who's heard of that? A few people. So compression of morbidity is this idea. It's really how we all want to live. We all want to live a long life, right? And have any sort of ill health or a decline in our health be compressed into the last little bit of our life. Or actually what we all maybe want to do is like, live a long life, and on this axis here, this is the probability of having no physical health limitations. So we wanna, we wanna and this is age 25 up to 95, we wanna go along in our life having no physical limitations until one day, I don't know, is that how you wanna go? <laughs> so that's good, again, that's called, the, the morbidity that comes with aging is compressed into the last bit of life. That doesn't really happen for anyone, but this, this graph shows, based on data from the Americans Changing Lives study, that you actually can see that it varies greatly by education level. So this top line here is the trajectory for people in the highest education level and the gr groups we followed over time. And they're kind of approaching compression of morbidity. Um, people in the highest education group are living, you know, this is age 75 here, they have a level of um, uh, not having physical functional limitations to their health here that the lowest education group is experiencing really by age 55. That's a 20 year age difference in that measure of health. There's other metrics of health. And so again, we know that um, again, this ideal of compression and morbidity, it looks like there, there is a, it's possible to get closer to that but it depends, uh, in this case, on your, on your education level. And also from a lot of work we've done and many other people have done, there is this um, notion that's emerged over the last 20 years very strongly of those things that pattern health, the kind of shorthand for that is called the social determinants of health. All the kind of things that matter, besides our genetics, those matter, no one's saying they're not, that, that it doesn't matter. But there's all these social factors that have really complex and intricate and synergistic ways that they impact health. So economic stability, there's many things under that. Neighborhood and physical environments, education, food, community and social context, and healthcare matters as well. Healthcare is important. But now here's where I start making people not so happy. That doesn't seem to matter in a developed, kind of, we're past the epidemiologic transition, uh, but even so, healthcare doesn't seem to matter as much as these other, other things, all right? And when we're thinking about the social determinants of health, we really think about them as, on multiple, multiple levels. So here we are, we're individuals, and we're talking about health, so at some point we have to think about how does that get under our skin, right? How does how do all these social things translate and you know, get, get into our bodies and create um, functional limitations, morbidity, mortality, all that. So at some point, we do talk about health, obviously, at the individual level. But all these things matter at these other levels as well. There's interpersonal interactions with other people, institutional, what happens in our schools, churches, work sites. That matters as well, community level factors, and then policy is driving all of this, right? So at the highest level of the, the model, there's, there's policy. There have been a lot of people, and still people trying now to figure out, well, what proportion of this kind of determinant, you know, this kind of determinant, what proportion is it in terms of determining health? I actually think this is a fool's 
exercise. It, ma it matters what kind of health outcome you're talking about in the first place. And also, I don't think it, it doesn't matter to me that, you know, a lot of people think healthcare has been undervalued in this. I don't know if you can see in these models, clinical care, 10%. Healthcare produces 10% of health. Um, this one has 10% here. This one brought it up to um, 20%. I mean, to me, it, do it doesn't matter. It's that all these things, all these things are important. And the important thing is that we put way too much emphasis on healthcare in this country. We think too much that healthcare is w the way to address health problems. I know all of you, many of you have seen the slide way too many times. Per capita spending on health in different countries and life expectancy, here's the pattern here, here's the US. We spend so much more on healthcare than any other country, way more on healthcare than any other country. We are such an outlier on it. Would you care if we actually had better population health outcomes? <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't care so much, but as those two things combine, it's like all the slides I just showed you about all the problems we have and, and sort of where we fit in the rest of the world. So we spend all this on, on healthcare, uh, but we don't have any, we don't have high life expectancy. We have higher rates of infant, infant mortality, kind of any health issue you look at, we don't score well on it. So and that's an important finding from population health research. And very, been a very consistent finding. Um, in 2007, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement came forward with this model called the Triple Aim. And basically, it was really um, a very thoughtful uh, approach saying, look, we need to do something about this. We can't continue to be this outlier. We're spending more and more on healthcare. We're not getting the results that we want. So the Triple Aim said, well, what we need to do is lower cost. We need to lower our healthcare costs. But we can't do that at the expense of the quality of care that people are doing, uh, are, are getting, and we can't do that at the expense of health in the, in the population, right? So the triple aim is three really hard things. It's lower cost, improved quality, and improved health outcomes, population health outcomes. And that's the phrase that's been used on the triple aim, population health improvement. That led with the triple aim coming forward with that and with some policy change to incentivize uh, uh, insurance plans, especially our big public insurance plans, Medicare and Medicaid, um, uh, to really think about this and try to achieve the, the triple aim, this new field called population health management emerged. And just, I, can I just remind you, population health has been all around for a long time, but now we have this new animal called population health management coming out of the, the triple aim that again was really focusing on, you know, reducing costs, improving quality, improving outcomes. So in the triple aim notion of population health, the focus here is on patient populations or populations of people who share a health insurer, they're in the same health plan. And again, we're looking at patient populations and their outcomes while attempting to co control for costs. And the idea here too is something that Jim likes very much. We're gonna use data analytics. Uh, we're gonna use all the information we have about patients. We're gonna use data to drive interventions and try again to um, uh, uh, control costs without reducing quality and getting better out outcomes for it. There also in the, the population health management movement is a recognition of the social de determinants of health. That's there. Um, but that's what we're mostly gonna talk about. Um, and also there's a recognition that, well, population health management probably should have some partnerships with public health and community resources if it wants to try to address some of these social factors that in influence health. So in the past, hard to know, I'd say probably in the past seven or eight years, um, the number, well, right now um, we think s at least 70 universities have a college, a department, or a degree program 
in population health, management, population health, or population medicine. All these words are sort of used. Um, I'd say probably 80% of those are in the past seven or so years. This is a new movement. Um, within health systems, um, many now have population health management units or activities. Um, there's new journals, there's new professional conferences, there's professional associations, there's executive education, and there's also a lot of money to be made in population health management. There's all kinds of new business products, data analytics and consulting opportunities. Um, here's just a quick graph of predictions of um, the population health management market size, looking at both software that's being sold to people to manage the data on their, populate, their patient populations, but also services and inter interventions. And in this is in the billions of dollars. So this is growing very, very fast. And again, there's all kinds of new companies and business opportunities and software and services in the business of population health. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I think in general, I mean, there's some really good things about this movement um, towards population health within the healthcare system, but I have three reasons that I'm really worried about this that I, I'm gonna try to get through pretty quickly. All right, so the first one is what um, sociologists refer to as medicalization. Who's heard that term before? Right. So medicalization, and this has been around for a long time, concerns that um, personal, behavioral, even social issues are viewed through a biomedical lens, which then emphasizes that the problem lies within individual rather than social pathology, and that it's clinicians and healthcare providers who have the authority for the diagnosis and treatment of it. Let me just quickly give you a few examples. So menopause, um, which is something that every woman who has the, the privilege of living to a certain age will likely go through, um, has been referred to as estrogen deficiency disorder. So that's sort of, people say that's a medicalization of a like, normal aging process. And right now, it's a much lower rate right now, but right now, anyone want to guess how many women uh, are on hormone replacement therapy in the United States? What percent? It's 44 percent. It used to be like 70 or 75, right? So anyway, it's the med medicalization of an aging process. Um, obesity, is that a disease? I'm looking at my public health friend, Barbara, it's like, no, it is, it is not. But obesity has become very, very medicalized. And when it's medicalized, then what do many people think is the way to deal with the problem of obesity. It's individual diagnosis, individual level treatment, rather than thinking about all the things in our environment that have contributed to this. Um, and quickly, I think this one is really interesting to me. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder has been going up. The rates have been going up very much. It's going up more in um, school environments that are very resource constrained. And also a study just came out showing that in school districts with a September 1st cutoff date, so for all of those of you in here who take program evaluation, this is a really cool regression discontinuity design. Um, what the researchers did is look at kids who were born right before the September 1st cutoff date for starting school and kids born right after, and the ones born right after had to wait a year to go to school, right? So comparing those kids, the rates of ADHD diagnosis are much higher in the younger kids, right? Because they get in school and they have behavioral. So people are worried that ADHD, no one's saying it's not a real thing, but ADHD diagnosis is really the medicalization of issues dealing with behavioral problems in school settings. All right, so last, um, last December, I. I wrote a little essay, a thousand words, uh, on the medicalization of population health, who will stay upstream uh, in the Millbank Quarterly, which has been getting me a lot of love and also some, some um, not love. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say hate, that's too strong. But anyway, so in, in this piece I argue that population health, which again has been, a long, been around for quite a while, 
and it's my thing, right? It's my field. Population health is being usurped by something uh, as something to be defined and managed by the healthcare system. And it includes the belief that population health is actually a new thing. And you can, you can read it all the time, and you probably won't get as irritated as me. But um, population health, this is a relatively new term that has not been precisely defined. Or the term population health first em emerged in 2003 after two doctors defined it. Um, it's a new concept that emerged with the triple aim model. I mean, of course, that's not true, but the idea here is that, it, that it's a new sort of thing. Yes, it's irritating to me uh, in terms of my field, but I'm worried about it for so many other reasons. So first of all, I think it's just really ignoring what is a good and rich history of over 200 years of research and policy regarding the social determinants of health and health disparities. I also worry about it for what I refer to as denominator shrinkage. Um, the popul population health, when I think about it and do research on it, the population is everybody in a social, political, geographic sort of space. Population health management, the denominator, the population, is people who are simply sharing a health plan or a healthcare institution, probably for a pretty short period of time. So for, to me, that's a, it's a much more narrow group of people we're caring about. And people are going to be going in and out of those populations. And also, it's part of a long history of conflation. Uh, and it's due to the medicalization of thinking about health in this country. We can't, we have a hard time thinking about health without thinking about health care. But they're not the same thing. And health disparities are not the same thing as health care access quality outcome disparities. Health equity isn't the same as health care equity. Also, and let's get ready for all the debates going on. They're going on right now. But what are we going to do? Sometimes it's phrased, what are, what are we going to do about health in the United States? Or what are we going to do about health care? What is all anyone's talking about? Health insurance. Right? So health insurance is not health care, and it's certainly not health policy. So this is a bigger pattern. So now, here we go, population health has now become medicalized and conflated with population health man management, and the social determinants of health are being conflated um, with patient social needs. What the healthcare system is calling the social determinants of health is actually really individual level needs within patients. And I worry about that for a lot, of, a, a lot of reasons, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A if, if you want. But I, I think it, it misdirects policy and investment of resources uh, in so many really important ways. All right, so I'm also worried about this because the efforts that the healthcare system is engaging in right now in the space of social determinants of health and uh, population health management are very much what we call downstream. They're really aimed at the individual level. And so what's happening primarily in this space is that patients with identified social issues are, they're being identified and then they're being referred to community partners who are already so underfunded and exhausted um, and their safety net is full, but the healthcare system's now gonna identify more of these needs and then you live this day to day, Alfreda right, um, pushes them out to the, the, the community. Um, there is a report that just came out um, last month from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine called Integrating Social Care into the Delivery of Healthcare, Moving Upstream to Improve Our Nation's Health. The premise here is that integrating social care into healthcare delivery holds the potential to achieve better outcomes for the nation and address major challenges facing the U.S. healthcare system. That sounds great. It's not going to work. <laughs> All the research and evidence we have suggests that this, this promise is it's an overpromise. It's not, it's not going to work. Let's take a moment and talk a bit about this, um, this phenomenon that's happening. So the best estimates right now are that 25% of health care delivery systems in the United States are screening their patients for social determinants of health. And maybe some of you have had this experience as well. I saw um, a tweet, 
about a year ago from a physician that said, I screen my patients because some of them have social determinants of health. And it's like, okay, we all do. We all have social determinants of health. You know, really what is going on is screening patients for social needs. Sam, you're here, right, Samantha? Yes. So <laughs> the great fortune of working with Samantha Ivan for several, several years, and we're working on this, and um, it's okay I'm telling him this is your, Sam started filling, went to the doctor and started filling out this, and she's like, hey, I'm being, I mean, screened for social determinants of health. And so this is Sam's, um, maybe we're violating HIPAA rules now, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Okay, anyway, it's things like, you know, things that you can see on here. In the past year, have you had a hard time paying your utility company bills? Yes or no? And Sam nicely just, you know, doesn't have that problem, so she says no. But so from the time I started worrying about this and looking at it, maybe four or five years ago, at that time there were three screening tools out there, and now there are dozens and dozens, and they all say they're validated which all that means is that they actually are measuring people's social needs. Um, so that's okay, but um, what are some of the things being looked at? Here's the domains that are being promoted in this area of screening patients for social determinants of health. So food insecurity, utility needs, transportation, employment, social isolation and support, housing instability, financial resource strain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not all clinicians don't like this. Um, it's taken their time. Um, they're not sure what to do with that information. They're usually not the one to have to deal with the information. Now, some physician, physicians like it because they say it better, help, better aids me in understanding the social context of my patient. And I might do a better job with you thinking about why aren't you, you, know, why aren't you taking your meds? Well, what are the other things going on in your life? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of information could help a, a clinician in clinical care, but that's not why the data is being collected generally. It's being collected because the healthcare system then thinks it's gonna do, it's gonna do something, something about it. So there's lots of pros and, and cons um, with this. And again, on the pro side, clinicians understanding the social situations and context of their patients is good. But also on the con side, there are a lot of things to be worried about. A long list here, uh, I'll unpack a couple of them in, in just a, a second. But I do worry too that you know, busy, untrained clinicians, uh, people, fill, people filling out this form, right, and then what's gonna happen? You fill out this thing, you turn it in, and then usually nothing's going to happen. That's just gonna exacerbate mistrust, frustration, um, and uh, you know that that's not good. We have these issues, especially with communities of color trusting healthcare providers and systems. Um, it's also it's medicalizing social factors. Again, it's conflating social determinants of health with social social needs. Um, so I've I I actually get out of here once in a while. So I go around and I I talk to people about this, and I know there are several health systems in the University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine is one that has started screening some patients in primary care settings um, for social determinants of health, but this is being used more for data collection. We wanna be able to better describe our patient population. And to that I will say, okay, but do patients know that, <laughs> right? Do they know what the, what's gonna be done with the data? And again, are you creating unfulfilled expectations, exacerbating this mistrust, mistrust and um, frustration? But in lots and lots of places, these screening tools are being used to then think about interventions. Um, I have, a, I have a master's degree in um, preventive medicine and epidemiology, and I had to take lots of classes on screening. Uh, and Screening 101 tells you don't screen people for something unless, Dr. Freed, right. So don't screen, there's no point in screening anyone for anything unless then you think you can do some kind of intervention for it. So again, what's, what's, being, what's being done? Um, I'm gonna move ahead here. So there is um, fundamentally, 
again, when the screening, screening happens, it's identifying this lowest level, um, and it's important, but at the individual level, a patient need. It's not addressing the cascade in that social ecological model of things that are driving those needs within people, but within neighborhoods and communities, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, improving education, access, and reducing student, student debt, is a, that's a social determinant of health, trying to address that versus interventions that focus on patients' health literacy. Um, screening patients for trouble, paying for their prescription, prescriptions and utility bills, again, that might be important if you can do something about it, but that is not addressing the social determinant of health, which is it's poverty and income insecurity that's driving those problems uh, in the first place. And then that leads me to be worried about, well, what's, ha what's happening uh, out there in terms of interventions? Um, and I'm worried about a lot of them, a lot of them going on. Um, so let me tell you about the little, you know, some work that we, we did recently. Population health management, a really um, common thing that's happening is the data are being used to identify the super utilizers or the highest users of healthcare. And then from there, those highest users, and that could be defined, we did a study looking at um, interventions addressing the super utilizers of emergency departments. That's really expensive um, for people to show up there. So who are those highest users defined sometimes as people who have 40 or more trips to the emergency department in one year? Or maybe it's 20 or it's the people in the top 5% of the distribution, whatever. Um, so Samantha, who's here, um, led, uh, led our team doing a systematic lit review of 44 published studies of interventions, trying to um, identify, first of all, those super utilizers, and then intervening with them. And the most common model of intervention was a case management model, where the idea was, well, well, these people have complex medical needs that need to be managed, but they also have some social needs, and we'll connect them with social services within the community. Um, what do you think we found? There's a lot of buzz about these interventions. They work. I have been, I can't tell you to how many meetings I've been to where a health system has done this kind of work and not published it and said, we looked at our super utilizers, we gave them an intervention, and the next year their um, rates were way down. Um, it works. Well, in our systematic lit review, we found that the studies, this again, for those of you, this is why we make you take program evaluation, Ford School students. Um, the studies that actually had a comparison group or a control group um, found the same level of decline. So it turns out if you take the people at the tail, the, the end of a distribution, you take the highest users of healthcare, the next year they're gonna look better. Just because it's, reg it's regression to the mean. It's a regression to the mean problem. So that was disappointing, right? It's disappointing to all the people out there who are doing these, doing these kinds of interventions. So now I've made you all sad. Um, what works? I'm, I'm Debbie Downer. There's so much sadness going on. Can you tell I like dogs? I don't have a dog. I want a dog. <laughs> okay. So what's going on out in the world? There are lots of positive sorts of interventions going on, and I want to get to some Q and A. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go through this pretty pretty quickly. But um, something called the medical legal partnership is interesting. And Elfrida's here. I don't have time, Elfrida, to talk about what um, Michigan Medicine. Oh, Maria's here too. Oh my God, I've had the privilege of working with some people in Michigan Medicine about a really innovative way to use community benefit dollars. So all nonprofit hospitals have to show the IRS in order to have their tax exempt status that they're investing uh, in things that are to the benefit of the community. And um, the University of Michigan is doing some really innovative work in that regard and actually pushing money out to the community, letting the community define what they want to do, explicitly addressing the social determinants of health. They're applying for money for intervention work to address the social determinants of health, and it's um, very exciting. And actually, there are some health systems that are investing in, in housing 
both housing first interventions, which are which is a model of providing housing for the chronically homeless or people at risk for it. But actually, there are some health systems that are investing in just building up the number of affordable housing units within their communities. Um, there's a really big project going on in Baltimore right now, and also United Healthcare. Um, is investing in 80 different communities across the country to provide more affordable housing for the community, whether or not those people get their health care from them. All right, so at this point um, in the talk, uh, and usually recently I've been, um, I've been invited to talk to a lot of people within healthcare systems. I gave a keynote at the Cleveland Clinic uh, a couple months ago, and there were a lot of people in white coats sitting in the audience, and you know what that means, right? And so by this point in my talk, and I gave kind of a different talk there, but they were like this. <laughs> uh, and so here's the point where I say to my healthcare provider friends, to my healthcare system friends, don't get defensive about this, because there are so, there are so many challenges for the healthcare system to go upstream. Right? It's not a criticism to say this is going to be challenging. It's not the primary mission or responsibility of the healthcare system. There's a lack of expertise. And also, fundamentally, this is about public policy. It is policy that is driving the things that create health advantages over our life course. It is policy that is driving the things that create health disadvantages over our life course. So. And also, who's going to pay? Who's going to pay for all this stuff that needs to be done? So again, every you know, and everyone says community benefit money. Well, that only goes so far, right? Um, it's it's a place to start. So there are conversations within Medicaid for um, uh, actually paying for some non-medical interventions. Right now, Medicaid is very very constrained to pay for anything other than medical care. But what if Medicaid could pay for housing? those kinds of things. Um, and also, there's um, some interest in public-private pi partnerships. And again, I've been doing some work in this space with Samantha and some other people looking at the possibility of social impact bonds, or what's also referred to as a pay-for-success model for doing the, this kind of intervention. So um, here's my picture of Sedona. Maybe it's more for me to like center. I'm going to wrap up, and we have a little time for questions. So good news. Um, I think here is that population management and other healthcare system efforts have brought some new attention and action on the social determinants of health, on patient social needs and health equity. I am delighted that, that these conversations are going on within the healthcare system. That is the good news. However, I'm really worried that, because it's what our healthcare lens does, that this has medicalized the notion of social determinants of health and narrowed and steered population health efforts towards this downstream path that is going to be probably good at identifying patient social needs, but it's not heading anywhere in the direction of the meso, macro, these upper levels of change that are needed. And I put this here just to say, I'm not the only person saying this. There's a big report that just came out. Um, what are some of the responses to the arguments that I and other people are making? Um, and I've heard these all, and I've heard all of these in the last few weeks, by the way. But Paula, it's better than nothing. I'm actually not sure about that. Um, Paula, don't let perfect be enemy of the good. At least the healthcare system is trying to address social factors. The one I hear the most is like, shh, you are going to anger the beast that has all the money. The healthcare system has all the money, and you're going to make them mad, and they're going to say, we finally are, we care about social determinants of health, and now you're complaining about that? We will just go walk away. But also people ask me, are you, are you, t are you telling clinicians to stay in their lane? Uh, and to that, I want to say emphatically, I am not. I am not telling my very good friends and colleagues and collaborators um, who care about healthcare policy and work within the healthcare system to stay, stay in your lane. What I am saying, however, is like, let's get in the right lane. And to me, the right lane is um, not downstream, or now I'm gonna make, how many of you like to hike? My family here is like, I'm, 
crazy about, I like dogs and I love hiking. Um, so downstream population health management activities are, think, are doing a nice job of grooming easy trails. But they're not leading up to, I didn't take this picture hiking. This is not the kind of hike, <laughs> this is not the kind of hiking I do. But anyway, they're not leading up that mountain. They're not leading up to the hard places where we need to do the hard stuff. And that's where public policy comes in. Social policy reform is the only thing that's going to help us address the social determinants of health and achieve health equity in this country. And number one, if we don't do anything about systemic racism and institutional discrimination in the United States, we will never have racial health equity, ever. That is the underlying history and still current driving force behind that. We need investments in all of these things. Um, and now I will just say, I, I have loved being in and working in uh, schools of public health for the majority of my career. I'm now here at the Ford School. And the reason I, I'm at the Ford School is because I feel like I needed to learn more about all these kinds of social policy from some of the best experts in the world. They're here at the Ford School on education policy, on um, poverty prevention, poverty. Did I see Luke in here? He was here. He's busy preventing poverty. OK. <laughs> uh, criminal justice reform, et cetera, et cetera. So health equity requires a very broad policy approach. Social welfare policy is health policy. All these kinds of policy are health policy. And yes, health care policy is health policy as well. But it's downstream. And if we don't do anything about all this, we're still it's still putting a Band-Aid on it. And we're gonna, we're gonna have all this investment in population health and have no better population health outcomes. That's my worry, that's my passion, and that's what I do. Thank you so much for coming today. We have some time for questions. Yes, and I, I should have or, said at the beginning, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, please, because we're being live streamed, please wait for a microphone before you ask your question. And we would appreciate it if you would identify yourself first. So again, um, we would love a, a couple of questions. Uh, so, Paula, one of the things, by the way, great lecture and great way to look at the health care system. You. It's uh, or the health policy system, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned health insurance companies, mm -hmm. having worked at one time for yes. United Health Care. Uh -huh. I kind of know that. What you didn't mention at all was the pharmaceutical companies. And uh -huh. when you take the medicalization of a condition, mm -hmm. then there's a pill for it. Sure. How much do you think the pharmaceutical companies and their lobbying are, are driving some of this medicalization and or, and or why, uh -huh. didn't, why didn't you mention them as well as health insurance? <laughs> Just curious. Well, I think it's, it's really easy to pick on the pharmaceutical companies um, because I think that that is driving a lot of the, the, the medicalization. Um, but let me give you a quick example where I actually think medicalization can be good sometimes too. So actually it was the... It was the medicalization of nicotine addiction. You know, actually calling it nicotine addiction syndrome and giving it a code um, that gave pharmaceutical companies the, the notion that, well, then if, if it's a diagnosis, then uh, it, it made them invest in nicotine replacement therapy, basically. So what we know now about um, the, the best ways for people who are addicted to nicotine to quit smoking is with nicotine, nicotine um, replacement therapy and companies were reluctant to invest in that unless they knew that people, you know, that insurance companies would pay for it um, and that they could recoup. It costs a lot of money to, you know, to develop a drug, et cetera. So the medicalization of nicotine um, addiction syndrome is thought to have, you know, set out a whole course that um, helps create these products and has led to a lot of smoking cessation. So it's not, it's not always bad, but um, 
Yeah, that's all I want to say about the pharmaceutical companies till we, <laughs> till we chat later. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris Rostoyanovsky. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> she used to be, well, she is my mentor, long-term mentor now. <laughs> um, I think I, my question is kind of living around, I think we all agree that this is true, this uh -huh. lovely little slide up here, but how do we start to move the needle um, in that direction? And I don't mean just conversations, but now we have majority of Americans, for example, who feel that the Democratic Party is too left-leaning. Right. Which, I mean, if we're going to address all these things, look, mm -hmm. let's, we need to be radical. And not radical in like an extreme sense, but we need new ideas. But how do we create a culture where everyone buys into this and that our goal as a society is this? And this is something I struggle with in my work as well. Yes, well, you know I do as well. I don't know. That is the million-dollar question. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to make everyone else care about the same things I do in the same, the same way. Um, but again, one of the reasons I'm really, I'm worried about the healthcare system getting so much in this game is because I think all the attention and resources is going to be down here. And then it's gonna, and then a lot of people, we've seen this time and time again, it absolves policy from doing other stuff. The healthcare system is taking care of social needs and health. So we don't really need all this stuff. We'll just, you know, sort of punt it to them. I don't know. I have, um, again, I, g I give a lot of talks and I give a, a, a lot of talks or I go to a lot of conferences where there's a lot of clinicians there. And every talk I um, have seen recently has started with a photo of a patient and sort of a story of an individual patient. Meet my patient, Mrs. So-and-so. I just saw this in Cleveland a few weeks ago. She um, is housing insecure. She has mental health issues. She is socially isolated. Her family lives away from her. You know, just list social determinant of health after, you know, or social need after social need. Making the case for why we should care about Mrs. X. And we all know our community, our communications friends tell us, our media friends tell us, you gotta have stories, right? You gotta have the anecdotes. That's what's gonna make policy makers care. I don't think, I don't think they care. <laughs> um, and actually, so, and I know I'm not like everyone else, but I, I just always wonder, like, why don't statistics move people, right? So, <laughs> but I'm, seri I'm serious, I'm serious. <laughs> My son's going, mom, okay. Um, here are some statistics, okay. One out of five children in this country lives in poverty. Right now, over 40% of African American children in this country are living in poverty. All right. State, I, I got a bunch, because I, I like statistics. A couple more. The state of Oklahoma, over 100 school districts have moved to four-day school weeks because Medicaid has taken over so much of the state budget, they can't fund their public education system anymore. They cannot afford to run buses five days a week, so they have gone to four-day school weeks. This is happening in Colorado, Idaho, Montana. Should I go on? Right, so I, again, I don't, know, I don't know why people, this isn't a big red flag. Oh, here, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you one more. There, is no uh, community in the United States in which someone making minimum wage can afford a two bedroom apartment. There is no community in the United States where a single mom working minimum wage could afford an apartment without some help um, with more than, than one bedroom. These are crisis statistics to me. And so the fact, I don't know, I don't know. I, Christopher, okay, we're gonna have to get together for a drink again <laughs> at the last word, but yeah. Yes. Do you have a microphone for? Um, could you say oh, more about social impact bonds and how you ideally would organize them at a local level to make them work to deal with some of these oh. upstream issues? Yeah, oh, we have so many papers on this. So um, I didn't have time to talk about it, but um, 
So yeah, my colleague Samantha and I really do believe that this is not this is not a magic bullet, but we also so social impact bonds are when a private investor puts up the money for an intervention, and if it provides some value to the public sector, the government, they will pay back the private investor. But they'll only pay back the private investor if a set of um, outcomes that's been predetermined have actually been achieved. So it's actually, this is you know the really sexy topic of performance-based contracting, uh, in which private, again, a private investor would put up money, public sector finds it, um, of a value and then we'll pay back the private investor. Most of the private investors doing this are nonprofits, so they're really not out to make money uh, about it. So um, yeah, we think there's a lot of promise in this area and where we've seen the best results are in um, supportive housing interventions. Um, uh, it's really interesting projects going on in the US. Um, using this model to support early childhood education and, um, and pre-kindergarten education is another area. And then also, um, we have a paper on, we did a simulation model in Detroit where if we use this model to have a, the private investor money um, improve the housing stock and reduce asthma triggers. And if you combine that with good medical case management, because that's important, <laughs> Um, that could reduce hospitalizations in emergency departments, and that actually would pay for itself. But there's all kinds of legal and regulatory constraints on that, so I'm happy to follow up with you. But we, we see with a new federal law that was passed last year, CIPRA funding, we, we see the door opening for Medicaid to get into the social impact bond space. Uh, I'm Mitch Vernick. I'm on the Ford School Committee, and I'm also an alum of the Ford School. Great talk, Paula. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. So, uh, assuming we wanted to, to move in the direction that you suggest, which mm -hmm. makes great sense, and we were looking for funds, and you talk about statistics, uh, we hear a lot about end of life costs and, and the massive disproportion. Mm -hmm. How how does culture, religion? the medical system, all those things. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, since it appears to be a large amount of money with statistically minimal payoff. Yeah, so in the, one of the differences in the United States versus other co countries is a culture around health care. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of weird because we pay for it in a really different way than other places that have uni universal um, uh, health insurance sort of system, but in the U.S. we we tend to some people have done some studies suggesting that um, a, a lot of people in the U.S. feel that when care is denied, and it's not so much to themselves, but it's to their loved ones, especially at end of life care. If you're going to tell, you know, stop, you know, I have a 90 year old mother. We actually we talk about this a lot too. She's like, I don't want a lot of stuff at the end of my life. Like, write this down, right? Because, um, you know, it's hard, it, it's hard for people who love other people to say, don't, you know, withhold the care, don't do everything you, you can. Um, we know um, for that compression of morbidity, uh, slide I put up there before, we know in the US that, um, except for the last few years where life expectancy went down, people are living longer. Um, we have an aging population. We also know people are living a longer period of their life with chronic conditions and lots of health healthcare needs. But our culture is not one where we want to, I don't know, how many of you want to deprive yourself of <laughs> you know, medical care? So I don't, I don't know, there's been lots of interventions that have been tried around that and, and none of them have worked really well and I have no, um, I have no magic bullet myself. But yeah, that, if we can't crack that nut, it's gonna be hard. But I know, and I don't mean to sound naive when I say this, um, you know. But again, I'm I'm really focused on if we can get people to those later stages of life in better health, that that would be good. It may or may not save health care, healthcare costs. I don't know, but um, it potentially could. So unfortunately, this will be yeah. the last question. Okay. <laughs> or not. Uh, 
Uh, I'm only doing this since no one else came in. <laughs> uh, I'm David Forey uh, with the uh, committee, Ford School Committee. Uh, and I really have two things. I'll just do the first one first but, uh, because of the story. But the second one, I have a question about okay. Medicaid, Medicare in mm -hmm. Oklahoma, Colorado, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I'm both public administration graduate of the program as well as social work. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the things you're talking about in terms of social needs uh, and meeting social needs hit me. Oh, yeah, that's what helped form social work as a mm -hmm. profession mm -hmm. in the early part of the century. A uh, uh, number of the leaders said somebody has to get out and drain the ditch. If we have cholera or whatever, you can't, it can't just be the patient. And in my own hometown of Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. current hometown, uh, the visiting nurses or community nurses who spun off from the Medical College of Virginia uh, around the turn of the century, 1900 to 1920, weren't well accepted in the medical field and going mm -hmm. outside the hospital. Mm -hmm. But when they got into the homes, social needs and they couldn't do their medical practice, of which they had a fair amount of leeway when they left the hospital and went into the homes. And uh, I think it helped preserve the uh, development of community nursing and uh, the Visiting Nurses Association for a good long time. They began to draw in people who had an interest in doing social work type things uh, related to the family and the community, if it meant housing or draining the ditch mm -hmm. or whatever. And in fact, a number of the nurses uh, moved into doing the social work part because they found that more rewarding than the medical part. Uh, and uh, then they ended up sharing settlement homes and so forth. Interesting history, wonderful. And social work benefited from that. It's wonderful. But what I really wanted to ask you about, because I've seen this in act action in Virginia a good number of years ago with the legislature, and I'm not sure I understood you and which program you were referring to in terms of the state budgets eating up Medicaid. being in a Medicaid, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. And that always sets me off, quite honestly, having watched it. It is such an easy excuse for legislators mm -hmm. to say, well, we can't because of federal mandates or demand and you all in your districts, we know you want uh, these services and to uh, be paid for, et cetera. And then we add on today those states that are now more and more turning to funding when they didn't go along the first time in terms of mm -hmm. increasing Medicaid, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's, a, it's a frustrating thing. But when I heard you say that, I said, well, gee, yes, but do we let them get away with that? How do we do that? Yes, we do, but how do we not do that? So I, I'll leave that as a question. <laughs> Thank you. Voting, I don't, I don't know. It's hard. I mean, I, I, I will say that Medicaid now takes up probably at least 40% of every state budget, and that's too, that's high. That's really it does it does crowd out other other things. I mean, nobody, even I think the most left leaning Democrat, wants to keep raising taxes and taxes and taxes to to pay for this. So, Medicaid Medicaid is a, a problem. Uh, in public administration and you know public finance and, and trying to find ways to do other things. I agree in Oklahoma if they wanted to fund public schools they probably would find a, 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 a way to do it but that's the excuse that's being made. Medi Medicaid has crowded out so much of our budget we can't give local you know school districts any more money than we are. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.